Welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, we, this is our special topics for March 2023. So today we have Caroline Robert DeMassey talking to us about trauma-informed care. Uh, Mrs. Robert DeMassey earned her associate's degree of applied science as a physical therapist assistant at Lehigh Carbon Community College. Additionally, she received she recently earned a special certification in pelvic health from Herman and Wallace Pelvic Rehabilitation Institute, becoming only the third physical therapist assistant in the nation to earn this qualification. Mrs. Robert DeMassey has been practicing in outpatient pelvic health for the last six years with her previous experience in orthopedics and neurologic settings. Through her education and practice, she has worked with many pa patients and clients with significant trauma in their lives and has had the opportunity to help them with trauma-informed care. She practices at physical therapy at St. Luke's in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, at, at a specialty pelvic health office serving women, men, and non-binary individuals. For those of you attending, please make sure you scan the QR code or sign in using the codes on the screen. I've also placed it in the chat box. Um, make sure you do that, and then at the end, please complete the quiz and the course evaluation so that you get CE or CME credit for this. Um, and if you're watching the recorded version, please make sure you complete the quiz and the course evaluation so that you get CE or CME credit for this. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact me. But without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Mrs. Robert DeMassey. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you for the great introduction. I think I'll skip part of my presentation. Um, like he said, I specialize in pelvic floor therapy and I've been with uh, St. Luke's for two years now and it's been a fantastic ride. I uh, had the for good fortune of attending a conference in the fall uh, in Atlanta with fantastic speakers and wonderful topics ranging from anal fissures to prolapse, um, but one of the topics that they were covering was also trauma-informed care. And I have I have to be honest, I wasn't sure I would gain much from this talk um, in the sense that I feel I am a trauma-informed provider, a trauma-informed person. I thought it was all uh, basically common sense. I'm a good person, I treat everyone the same way, but do I? I see no color, no differences between a trans woman, a black man, and myself. This has been my line for years. Uh, how does that even make sense? There are differences, and that's a good thing, and it's okay. It would be a pretty boring uh, world if we were all the same. Our differences are what makes us stronger and more powerful. We cannot just be nice clinicians and assume our patients will be treated within a trauma-informed system. The language is forever changing and we need to be more open to learning. Growing up, queer was definitely not a nice word. Uh, and now it is an accepted word and they want you to refer to them as queer. Uh, the, uh, I also have two family members who ended their lives. I never understood when I shared that my cousin committed suicide and that my uncle committed suicide it always felt like I was portraying them in a lesser way than the truly wonderful humans they are. Now we say died by suicide. If someone calls us on making a mistake, uh, misgendering them, anything like that, instead of getting short and answering, well, it's impossible to keep up with all these changes. Thank them for teaching you. My self-reflection was supposed to be my last slide. Oops, one moment. was supposed to be my last slide, but for everyone who knows me, I get excited and I wanted to share why this is so important to me. What does trauma-informed mean to you? Can you describe to me what is trauma-informed care? During this presentation, I will review some of the terms and definitions in addition to supporting the importance of making changes at an organizational level versus just an individual level. Hopefully by the end of this presentation, presentation, we as a group can have a better understanding of how we can do better and improve our patient's outcome and addresses some of our own traumas and biases. So let me see if I can do this right. So some of the boring stuff, I'll just run through these slides quickly at the beginning. And here we go. And here are the learning objectives. And we'll start the presentation. What is trauma-informed care? This is a, 
um, definition that you can easily find. Trauma-informed care refers to a universal framework that involves making changes to program policies and practices to understand, identify, and address trauma. Uh, for me, this is next definition. I feel that it um, catches my attention and makes me understand a little more what we are all about in healthcare, certainly. At the core of trauma-informed care is primum non nascere, which translates from Latin as first do no harm. Um, what does it mean to be trauma-informed? Trauma-informed means reframing one's perspective. Uh, think of an iceberg analogy. You can't just look on what's in front of you. You have to see what's under the surface. Trauma-informed means being more reflective. Lots of soul searching can have negative and positive impacts on our own traumatic experiences. Trauma-informed means acquiring skills to respond more effectively to others who have experienced trauma. Being more aware can allow us allow for us to avoid re-traumatization. Uh, this goes over the trauma-informed approach. There are six key principles, and I just uh, outlined them here, and then it goes, the next two slides covers the guiding principles. I'll give you more a little bit the Sparks notes about it, but they're all written down, so if you want to look at them later. Collaboration and mutuality. We should view patients as partners when developing their treatment plans. With collaborations, patients can become active participants in their care. Empowerment is the second one, voice and choice. We work to empower our patients to take control of their health. Cultural, historical, and gender issues. We need to recognize cultural, racial, gender, or other biases. Um, I just realized I skipped over one slide. I'll go back in a minute, but I did want to share a story about uh, cultural uh, issues. During the pandemic, the first year I was placed in the ICU uh, to help with the proning team. And obviously, as we've all gone through a lot of traumas during the last few years, uh, this was no different. Everybody was on a ventilator, ECMO machine. There's tubes coming out of everywhere. And in the first room, I'll always remember this, the first room in the ICU was a Muslim gentleman, a young guy, and uh, he was intubated on an ECMO. And the patient's family begged for, the, uh, to, for them to come in because they wanted them to respect that he needed the prayer and that he needed to have his bed facing the sun. And uh, unfortunately, the family, obviously, as we know, could not come in. But it was absolutely fantastic because the nurses made sure that those wishes were respected. And I don't know if you've ever heard a Muslim prayer played over an intercom, but it can be loud and maybe a little bit annoying for someone that doesn't understand that language. But to me, it brought me to tears every time because they respected this man. He ended up passing, but at the end, he was well surrounded. So there's just like a short story I wanted to share. I'm going to go back to the first three guiding principles. Uh, which are safety, the importance of being safe for the staff and the people we serve, trustworthiness and transparency. We need to be transparent to build a sense of trustworthiness. We should be well informed about the policies and procedures that could impact how we care for our patients. Peer support and mutual health. We need to assume any one of our patients may have experienced a traumatic event. It's important to understand various traumatic conditions and how they may affect patient care. Some, this is some of the language that um, for me was interesting just because I, I had never really uh, understood what the four R's uh, stood for. So I thought it might be interesting to add this to the presentation. So the four R's in the trauma informed approach are as such, realize the widespread impact of trauma and understand the potential paths for recovery. The second one is recognize signs and symptoms of traumas in clients, students, families, and staff, um, like negative emotional state, difficulty concentrating, impulsive, destructive, irritability, aggressive behavior. Sometimes we think like the guy that just came in is just such a nasty guy, but you know, he's got a story too. And it's for us to, uh, you know, take the time to maybe try to pick up on some of those clues. And the other one is uh, response, integrating our knowledge about trauma into policies, procedures, and practices. 
so that we can um, at all costs resist re-traumatization. Uh, I just like the slide, to be honest. No, <laughs> this is no other reason why that's there. But it, the, oh, I'm sorry, the next one. Sorry, it confuses me. But the three E's, let me go over that, is event, experience of event and effect. Event can be a single or multiple occurrence. As some people have gone through several uh, different events that can just kind of be um, more traumatic as it goes on. Experience of event. A person's experience of an event can help determine if it's a traumatic event. Two siblings can have a very different experience from the same event. An effect, it can experience right away, uh, but it can also be delayed. Effects can be short-term or long-term. All right, this is my night slide that I really liked. Uh, so this is, again, just to show that the team effort, uh, but also not just as a team in our clinic, we're looking at more on an organization level. Uh, this was a study done in the UK, and basically uh, trauma-informed care in the UK, where are we? So they looked over 24 different documents. They interviewed 11 professionals from healthcare organizations uh, to understand like where they were, where they needed to go, and basically overall concluded that a coordinated, more centralized strategy and provision of trauma-informed healthcare needed increased funding for evaluation and education through professional networks about evidence-based trauma-informed health systems can all contribute towards evidence-informed policies and implementation. So it needed really to be more uh, also at an organizational level. Organizational level, what can we do? Engaging patients in organizational planning, training of all staff, creating a safe environment, preventing secondary traumatic stress in staff, hiring a trauma-informed workforce. Um, training of all staff, I find that sometimes we are given opportunities as certainly as for myself as a clinician, I'm given more opportunities for um, to attend some, you know, some uh, ground rounds like today or other lectures, but also we have to think of, you know, uh, our wonderful uh, front desk coordinator Ingrid and the guy that's emptying, uh, you know, the garbage cans and everybody because anybody that comes in contacts in contact with patients um, that can change, right? We all know I'm fortunate. I have 45 minutes with uh, most of my patient. Uh, maybe it gives me an opportunity to build a little more trust, but to be honest, I think we all know that uh, the first minute you meet someone is when you are, it can make it a good experience or a bad experience. So to me, I think that training at all levels is very important. Uh, misgendering uh, someone when they first come into our clinic can quickly break any possibility of building trust. That can change the, the whole uh, mindset of this person. Uh, myself, um, I'm, I'm telling you all my flaws. This is a, a moment of truth for me. But do you only introduce yourself with your pronouns to people that you think would want to hear that? And I have to be honest, I think I do. Uh, you know, when I attended this conference, the, the, the gal was, you know, was saying you, you need to introduce yourself all the time. Just say, you know, my name is Carolyn. My pronouns are she and her. How would you like me to, uh, you know, um, you know, to address you. Um, now, you know, I find that I, I might do it more to someone that I think may be a trans or maybe have different pronouns. So I, I personally want to change that for myself and be more inclusive. At a clinical level, uh, involving patients in the treatment process, screening for trauma, training staff trauma-specific treatment approaches, a network of referral sources and partnering, partnering organizations. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, I think, you know, a lot of us might have been um, in a situation that someone shared with them that they were having suicidal thoughts. And I not, I feel that sometimes we're not, we, we don't always know what to do. Uh, I've had several times people have told me, you know, they're having suicidal thoughts. What do I do with this information? Do I contact the PCP? Uh, do I tell the patient? It'll get better. Uh, Report it in a note. Tell them to go to the ER. I, I would think that uh, anyone that's having suicidal thoughts, walking into a crowded ER might not be what they want to do. Uh, so understanding where we can find like 
we have a good uh, referral sources and partnering organization so we can best serve our community, but also our coworkers, our colleagues, our staff. Uh, this was a kind of a, a, a neat study. It was a, it was called a helping hand after a traumatic event, a randomized control trial in healthcare professional on the efficacy, usability, and user satisfaction of a self-help app to reduce trauma-related symptoms. Uh, the reality is one in four women and one in six men are victim of domestic violence. Domestic violence was defined as Controlling, threatening, or coercive behavior, violence, or abuse between those age 16 or older who have been intimate partners or family member. And they uh, went over the barriers of disclosing abuse to a healthcare provider. Fear of the consequences disclosing could have, uh, you know, had their children taken away. Being judged or criticized. Fear of further abuse from their abuser a lack of a relationship with their healthcare provider, lack of time uh, with a provider or continuity of care. Healthcare providers not maintaining eye contact or not listening. Many victims felt the healthcare setting was not where you could share your abuse. So they created this app, uh, which was like a, uh, they had, had this other app that was like a post-traumatic uh, for, um, PTSD, sorry, coach, and it offered education. Um, it facilitates a contact with the user's personal network and professional care. It had a checklist to assess and monitor symptoms. It had a calendar with all different like uh, self tests, exercise and activities. You could manage symptoms. They had some mindfulness exercise. And what was uh, neat was that they actually did not give any explanation on how to use the app because that's the real world, right? If you're going to tell someone to, you know, figure out something and they got to figure it out on their own, you can't just say you got to press on this button. So I probably would not do well. <laughs> I think Steve can confirm I'm not too good with technology. But um, so this was a, a, a neat study. So basically, for us, for all of us, whether you're, uh, the, you know, uh, with your colleague or with a patient, uh, implicit is is uh, some of the terms that I'd like you to, you know, think about. These are eight different tactics. Introspection: set a set time, set a set time to understand your biases by taking a personal inventory for them. This can be pretty uncomfortable. I can I can tell you it certainly has been uh, for me, but also like interesting, right? Uh, it can be done by taking tests uh, to identify your bias you may have, or just even like taking time to talk to people and having conversations. Uh, some of those conversations that can be a little uncomfortable, but can lead to some good stuff. Mindfulness. Once you understand the biases you hold, uh, be mindful that you're more likely to give in to them if you're under stress. Uh, so you need to, you know, if you're feeling stressed, pause for a minute, collect yourself and take a few deep breaths. Next one being perspective taking. If you think you may be stereotyping people or groups, imagine what it would feel like for others to stereotype you. And we say that all the time, but sometimes really taking the time uh, to really look into that a little more. Uh, learn to slow down before jumping to conclusions about others. Remind yourself or positive example of people from their age group, class, ethnicity, or sexual orientation. This can include friends, colleagues, or public figures, uh, such as athletes, members of the clergy, or other leaders. Individualization. Remind yourself that all people have individual characteristics that are separate from others within their group. Focus on the things you have in common. And check your messaging. Instead of telling yourself that you don't see people by based on their color, class, or sexual orientation, learn to use statements that embrace inclusivity. At Apple, um, they say we are not all the same, and that is our greatest strength. And take two, overcoming unconscious biases take time, understanding that this is a lifelong process and that deprogramming your biases require constant mindfulness and work. It's the power of words, right? We've <clears throat> They can empower us or they can inhibit us. Um, empower, you're smart, you're kind, right? Inhibit, you know, you're stupid. You hear, you start hearing that or don't do this, don't do that. 
Uh, we need patients. We meet patients in a healthcare environment. They might be worried about their health, about us misgendering them, assuming that they do not take care of their health because their BMI is high, which can cause them to be re-traumatized. Be trauma-informed and create a safe environment can, a can improve outcomes. Be informed, read their chart. When you meet them, make eye contact. Um, this was another study done, a systemic review of evaluation of trauma-informed organizational interventions that include staff training. And basically, uh, their findings were that, again, it, it had more uh, success and better outcomes if it was done at an organizational level. Uh, but also, you know, to do the staff training as well. Trauma-informed organizational interventions appear to have the most meaningful impact on client outcomes when the interventions include other components such as organizational policy changes. So what can we start doing now, right? So creating a social and emotional environment, positive, welcoming language. So if I walk into a clinic and I say, no cell phone, Ugh, like right off the bat, it puts you, you know, so please refrain from using your cell phones or just word it a little bit differently. The message is the same. We don't want cell phones in the clinic, uh, but it's just, it, the delivery is different. This is a big one. This one for me was a big one. Uh, I was, I shared this with Lauren, asking permission to close the door. In our world in pelvic floor therapy, certainly, a lot of our sessions are done behind a closed door. My first thing I do, please come in, and I close the door behind them. I have never asked, is it okay that I close the door? And to be honest, I've never been in a situation that someone called me on it, but I don't, I don't want that situation to happen either. So from now on, I ask permission, is it okay? And most people will say, yeah, sure, but I want to make sure that it's okay with them. So I don't want to assume... Asking permission to touch uh, in any setting, really. If you're going to take their blood pressure, may I? You know, I'm going to put my hand here. Is that okay? Eye contact and educate yourself. Things you not, might not be as comfortable with. There, there's a lot of things we can we can read. Uh, I want to uh, uh, share a quick story about uh, educating yourself. My uh, I have my brother-in-law uh, is deaf from birth, and so communicating with him is always a, a little bit of a challenge. Uh, but uh, two years ago when he was here, I took him to a trans event. And when I first told him that we were going to a trans event, he's like, wow, it's like, oh, he, he really didn't understand. And I, you know, I explained it to him, and he, but he doesn't have anybody in his surrounding that is trans and he didn't understand it. He says, I, I don't get it. It's just like, you know, he was very uncomfortable, but because I asked him, he came with me. And uh, so we went to this event. It was a vigil for people that had lost their life in the last year because of violence against um, trans. And Alan stood there with his sign, with this picture of a trans person that had passed away that year, tears rolling down his face. And he, he got it. He got it. But had we not gone to that event, it would have been, you know, and I'm not telling you to go to a trans event tomorrow, but you know, open yourself up to other opportunities and talking to different people. Uh, the body keeps a score. This was just, I, I'm just is a recommendation I have. Uh, it is a fantastic book. It was a, uh, to me, a must read book written by Bessel van der Kolk, which helps us understand the connection between the brain, mind, body, and how we can help with the healing of trauma. Uh, this is a quote that I like. Our bodies are texts that carry the memories and therefore is no less than reincarnation. And sometimes we see bodies like that. So we know, okay, maybe they're having pain, but sometimes there's absolutely no scar and they have a perfect, perfect belly, perfect abdomen, and there's still a lot of trauma right under that skin. So we need to be able to like see past. Impacts of trauma. Trauma, we know, now leads to chronic disease, depression, and substance abuse. Half of all U.S. adults report at least one traumatic event in their lives. Just to put it in perspective, um, at the moment, there's maybe 260 million people in the United States. That means like 130 
130 million. So look around the room, look, you know, next time you go to the grocery store, look around the grocery store. There's a lot of people that have been uh, victims of trauma. Two thirds of children report at least one ACE, which is, which is an adverse childhood experience by the age of 16. Again, that number, anybody that's got kids, you know, you, we, we always want to protect them. There's, like, you're talking about 50 million, over 75 million that have been victims of some kind of trauma. Uh, this is just, I'm not going to go over this, but I just wanted to, for you to, to see what the ACE chart, in case you see a score in a chart that might ring, you know, uh, that might make you understand what this um, chart is, what the number could be. Adverse childhood experience is a scale which can help us determine the possible long-term effect of trauma on an individual. The rougher the your childhood, the higher the number. People with high ACE scores are more likely to be violent, to have more marriages, more broken bones, more drug, pres drug prescriptions, more depression, and more autoimmune disease. People with an ACE score of six or higher are at risk of their lifespan being shortened by 20 years. So it's a number to, you know, it's good to, uh, to understand these numbers and these terms. Uh, Trauma-informed care shifts the conversation from what is wrong with you to what happened to you. There are many different types of traumas. Traumatic stress, just stress which induces the flight or fight response can reproduce intense physical and emotional response. Complex trauma would be uh, being exposed to several traumas and how it can have a domino effect. Retraumatization, recurrence of traumatic stress symptoms and relieving past traumatic stress symptoms in new situation. Secondary or vicarious trauma, having psychological Physio physiological, sorry, and physical symptoms in response to helping others is very common when uh, working with trauma survivors. And I would imagine that certainly post, uh, you know, after everything we've gone through in the hospitals with COVID, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of that as well with the staff. Historical trauma, also known as generational trauma, a trauma experienced by a specific group, cultural, racial, or ethnic group. Some signs of distress to know, uh, emotional reactions, anxiety, fear, powerlessness, helplessness, anger, um, physical uh, nausea, lightheadedness, increase in blood pressure, headaches, stomach aches, increase in heart rate and respiration, holding breath. And then behavioral reactions would be more like crying, uncoop uncooperative, argumentative, unresponsive, and restlessness and cognitive reactions, memory impairment, forgetfulness, inability to give adequate history. The effects of trauma on clinicians, burnout, secondary traumatic stress, compassion fatigue, uh, secondary or vicarious trauma, again, and historical trauma. So I, initially I had thought of adding some exercises, but I, I talked to the gal that I attended the conference to in the fall and said, oh, should I add some? She says, don't make people feel uncomfortable. They they can do, they, they can look into it and obviously they can reach out if they wanted to get more information. So I did not add any exercise at the end, uh, but I would, you know, encourage you to look into it. And these are some of the biases that, that we can have, right? Race, ethnicity, age, gender, LGBTQIA community, ability, affinity, beauty, name, weight. Um, I had a friend of mine share with me that her uh, one of her co-worker actually does not put her real name as her first name because she says they just right away they assume things. So she puts a Nicole instead of putting a Sharon or something different just because, you know, so those are things that they're good to recognize. Do you have, you know, biases? And uh, so this I talked about it at the beginning. I already told you uh, all my bi or some of my biases. I'm really excited about uh, sharing the last part of my uh, presentation. Uh, this is a um, a patient that was um, willing to sit with me. Uh, so I'm going to have. Do you want to? I just take oh. the audio. Oh, 
Go ahead. Okay. Talk. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm going to start this presentation. It's a little lengthy. It's like seven minutes, uh, but I hope I, I couldn't cut any more. And I hope that you uh, that you enjoy it because she she's got some good messages. So I hope that you um, you appreciate it. I am going to uh, unshare and then share it ag again. Just a moment. There we go. Now you should be good. Thank you. I love that when I shared with you that I was doing this trauma-informed presentation, you were so interested from mm -hmm. the get-go. Mm -hmm. You like you uh, you brought it up like you know every time we saw each other, you just like you know you asked about it, and it really um, kind of validated my like uh, decision to make this presentation if you want. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when I asked you, like, do you want to participate? Like, I think I just like pressed on the last word and you're already emailing me back. <laughs> yes. And I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, so, so honestly, I, I couldn't be more appreciative. I, yeah, I think you're going to bring, um, well, I feel that you bring such an interesting perspective as a patient, but also as a provider, uh, which, Thank you, you know, uh, I'm, I guess, you know, that to me is like the big thing because yeah. I, I can talk about it, but I really don't have experience on both sides. Mm -hmm. And I think that can bring a really interesting uh, side to it. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce you to this group. Uh, an original Jersey girl having grown up at the beach, Rebecca De Jesus currently resides in the Lehigh Valley with her amazing husband and fur babies. Yeah. Uh, she is a staunch advocate for all things trauma-informed and mentors women with various modalities on their healing and recovery journeys. Uh, Rebecca lives with severe chronic and severe medical condition, as well as complex PTSD from childhood and medical trauma. One thing that we have to remember is that, you know, it, it used to be that, that um, some people would refer to big T trauma and little T trauma. Um, so big T trauma being something like, you know, surviving an earthquake, um, having been a soldier at war, um, in my case, you know, going through decades of abuse as a child. Um, but the problem with that is then that um, makes it a duality, right? So that kind of makes it seem like one type of trauma might be worse than another. Um, there's uh, someone that I really admire. Um, his name is um, Dr. Gabor Mate, and I really like his definition of uh, trauma. And, and what he says is that trauma isn't what happens to you, it's what happens inside of you as a result of what happens to you. Tell me about this trauma informed yoga. What is that? <laughs> So um, unfortunately, I've, I've not been able to teach yoga for several years. I've been going through some uh, significant um, symptoms with a few of my colleagues who came at, to pelvic floor PT since last year and um, indefinitely. Um, but I, I first uh, learned of trauma-informed yoga when I got certified as uh, uh, yoga for recovery teacher, okay. so yoga for addiction recovery. Okay. Um, and what's interesting is way back when I started my yoga teacher training, which is years ago, and it took me a long time to complete it because I was going through dozens of surgeries, um, I remember having an internal interest in how can I relate yoga to trauma, right? So then flash forward a couple of years ago and I'm introduced to, you know, this yoga for addiction recovery 
And then I learn that it's taught through a trauma-informed lens. Um, not going to go into all the ins and outs of that because then we'd be here for days. Um, but similarly, there is a way to make a, a yoga class trauma-informed. So personally, I have taught um, trauma-informed yoga, and that's what it's been called. I have, I have taught yoga for addiction recovery, and in the, in the description, you know, it says that it's trauma-informed. And so, you know, one example of one of the things um, to do in a yoga setting in a trauma-informed way is, you know, position the students so their backs aren't towards the door. Because sometimes people with trauma oh, wow. can yeah. startle easily. Did you say I would, I would and say? so if you've ever taken a yoga class, if any of you have ever taken a yoga class, you know, um, you're in different positions, you know, sure. you're upside down, yeah. you're inside out, you're twisted like a pretzel. And so some people who have what's called hypervigilance can be startled easily. And then what that happens is it, you know, creates this cascade in the nervous system and then can create a feeling of not being safe. So if I were to, well, I am <laughs> speaking to <laughs> yes, a room full of providers, yeah, providers, attention. Yeah. Um, providers, staff, you know, whatever uh, the roles are of, of people attending this lecture, um, you know, look into it. You know, if, if, if you think you're already trauma informed, you know, read a little bit more. Um, there's lots and lots of books out there. Um, if you just Google it, you're going to find just pages and pages and pages on, you know, how to be trauma informed. Um, each one of you literally can make a difference because the patient experience, you know, doesn't begin once you're, you know, laying on the bed or the gurney in the hospital gown. The patient experience begins, you know, when you make the phone call or um, when you pull up and, and if you have to use the valet, you know, the, the man that's gonna help you at the valet, park your car, you know, that, that's when the patient experience begins. If you don't have as much time, you know, with a patient and, you know, let's say a patient comes in um, and they're obviously distressed and something is wrong, um, don't just ignore it. But if you don't have the time to address it fully, you know, if you sure. don't have the time to sit down and say, hey, what's going on? Like, you seem really upset. Um, maybe just acknowledge if, it. If, uh, if a health system wants to become trauma-informed, if a, a given uh, medical practice wants to become trauma-informed, you know, include that question on your paperwork. Um, I, I have been asked dozens and dozens and dozens of times, you know, if I experienced any type of um, abuse, and I can actually count on, on one hand the number of times that a clinician Ignore. said to me, oh, I noticed on your paperwork that you experienced childhood abuse. And that felt amazing because otherwise it's like, why did they ask me this question? Right. If they're not going to read the answer or acknowledge it. Um, so I think that is, is one thing that can definitely be done is, you know, included in the paperwork. If it's not in the paperwork, um, find a way to include it in the initial patient encounter. You know, if anybody wants to chat, um, you know, I'm here, so I'll be in the back. If you want to say hi afterwards, I'm, I'm always happy to talk about um, anything, but I love talking about trauma and trauma informed. I oh, oh. Hang on a second. OK, so uh, so this is it. This is the when I thank you for your time. Uh, I just want I want one more story, one more story. Uh, when we think that just one person cannot make the difference, I just wanted to share this story. I don't know if anybody has seen it in the morning call, but there's this uh, gal. Her name is Jackie and she lost her mother in the fall. And if she's in her 60s, traveled out west for an adventure. She'd been caring for her mother for years and came back and decided to create this um, this Facebook page to bring together women of the Lehigh Valley to go on hikes and adventures and paddle boarding and just, uh, you know, quick hikes and short walks. It doesn't matter. Uh, she started the group. It was only a few people, some of her close friends. 
uh, in September. The group is now up to 4,100 uh, people in the Lehigh Valley. I have gone on several events and have the, like met the most wonderful people. Um, and that was that was Jackie. That was Jackie just started, you know, had an idea on an airplane coming back from out west and said, I want to do something uh, to bring women together. Uh, we're not allowed to talk about politics or religion, so it keeps it uh, nice and light. It's just about uh, empowering and uh, making people feel good. So when uh, everybody can make a difference. That's it. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, what questions do you guys have? You can feel free to either type them into the chat or unmute yourself and ask verbal. Or for those of you physically here, you can ask verbally as well. Yourself. If you if you find yourself in the clinician potentially making a gap and using the wrong terms or it unintentionally saying something that a, a patient or even a, a non-patient, someone in the community may find um, as offensive or incorrect, how do you suggest we uh, correct ourselves or how should we handle that? I feel I feel you can own it. Honestly, that would be my thing. Own it. And um, I mean, it's not a comfortable feeling. <laughs> uh, but I think most people, most people will appreciate say like, you know, I apologize. I'm sorry. Uh, but please, you know, you know, tell me or correct me. Uh, I think we're in such a wonderful position to be able to have those conversations. Um, because typically when we see people in a hospital setting, they're not feeling great, right? And if we can make that difference by, you know, opening the lines of communication. So I would just say own it, just, just own it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for asking question. Thank you. Bye. Huh? Tomorrow morning, in my perspective, how would I ask that question? That's a, that's a, that is a good question. <laughs> the, um, is there anything? I think you could ask. Is there anything that you feel I should know that could affect your care? I think you know. I think that might be a nice way to start it. Um, do, would you agree? Like, just kind of like say, you know, is there anything that I should know? Because uh, I know, like, especially on the first meeting, sometimes it's hard, right? They're not always, I know that Melinda or Lauren will do the evals and then I might see them on visit two and I'll go, hey, Melinda, did you know? And they're like, why? How'd she tell you that? Because on the first meeting, sometimes people don't share things, right? But I think you could definitely open the conversation with that and say that if there was, and then also keep the door open and say, you know, uh, if you wanted to discuss anything, please, you know, know that this is a safe space. Question, do you ever use any um, standardized questionnaires for ACEs or the expanded ACEs or anything like that? It, not where we, not no, practice. no, not at our practice, not at our practice, yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much. This has been very informative. Thank you. Very thank much you. appreciate your time. Uh, thank you very much for everybody who attended in person and online. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact uh, Mrs. Robert Massey. Uh, oh, there is one additional question. Um, how would you suggest balancing, acknowledging, and respecting someone's trauma? while not allowing it to take over the entire time of the evaluation or treatment. Oh, that is a really good question. Yes. Um, okay, can you say that one more time? So like how to balance? How would you suggest balancing, acknowledging and respecting someone's trauma while not allowing it to take over the entire visit? 
set time, which the time during the visit. Uh, I personally, I, I'm just going to speak from experience, to be honest. I, I know um, and a few times I've acknowledged it, but um, kind of said, like, I know, you know, from your, you know, from your chart that you've had this trauma. Um, this is not going to be the focus of our session, it, but if you need, if I can direct you in the right direction, you know, if you, you know, whatever, whether it be counseling or a sexual counselor or anything like that. Uh, I and this is recently. I've just started to acknowledge it. Um, I don't know that really answers the question, but I think it can be hard that because we are not. First of all, you know, certainly in physical therapy, we're we're not counselors, we're not psychologists. Uh, so even to, you know, we can listen a little bit, but you don't want it to take away from the session of doing whatever else you had planned. So I would think that acknowledging and making sure that they feel like they have the right resources. Uh, versus spending, a, you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes talking about it. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Uh, as I was saying, please make sure you complete the quiz. Uh, please make sure you complete the course evaluation. And uh, please contact uh, Mr. Robert DeMassey if you have any additional questions. Uh, thank you very much for your time.